Welcome to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Every week, I'll be sitting down with a sales executive where they'll share their stories and experiences that produce game-changing results. Let's be honest, sales can be a tough game. I'm sure at some point, we've all delivered a less than stellar demo, been ghosted by a client or two, and sometimes, maybe we did more talking than listening. And that's where I can help. The stories and insights our guests share can be applied to your own business, your territory, or with your team, so you're not reinventing the wheel. Our weekly tactics and strategies help you get out of your head and start creating your own path towards game-changing results. Welcome back to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Now, it is March, Women in Sales Month, and I love continuing to promote strong women and I'm delighted to welcome back Professor Maya. Professor Maya is a public speaker and author of Hey Ladies, Stop Apologizing and Other Career Mistakes. She has a PhD in sociology and she's an apology hater. And before you freak out with an apology hater, let me just give you some context. She feels that we definitely should apologize when it's warranted, but women have the tendency to begin and end sentences with sorry. And one of her studies, she's doing a global study on women's confidence and communication. And through that, we're learning that when we do this, we are seen as less confident, incompetent. And so it's bringing awareness to why are we doing this? Is it certain situations? Is it certain titles we're talking about? Is it nervousness? What is it? So we can become aware of it and start replacing it. And so example, she says, is, you know, again, if we're late for a meeting, Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your waiting. Thank you for waiting. Thank you for your flexibility. Things like that that are a reframe. But what it does to our self-confidence and again, the perception of others, she talks about the voice in our head and how the negative can overrule if we allow it to and little ways to get out of it. A lot of our programming and our belief system and our self-worth stem from, you know, our, our childhood and ways that we can create distance between that so that we are not allowing any kind of childhood traumas or stories impact our self-belief, our self-worth today as adults. And so this is a great lesson for parents um, and understanding the importance of their role as well as teachers, that it's so important the way in which we are raising our children now. And so my eyes were open to that. Um, anyway, a lot of great, great takeaways here. And I would encourage you to listen. And I would encourage you to share it if you are if you f know somebody that you feel could really benefit, because there's so many times I hear women apologizing and I'm just thinking that was me once for sure too. But now that I've become aware, I, I don't do that unless obviously it's warranted, but I, I know the ramifications of doing it. And I know when people know that they're doing it, then there's a bit of shame after and they get mad at themselves. Why did I do that again? So great. Listen, uh, highly encourage you to listen and um, happy women in sales month. Hope you enjoy it. We'll see you next time. Well, March is Women in Sales Month, and who else can I bring on than the absolute guru of women and everything in women's health? I'd uh, love to re welcome a return back to Professor Maya. Hello. Hi, Karen. Thanks for having me back. My pleasure. I can't believe it's, uh, we have to look at the date. I think it's been over two years, but um, I know. really felt compelled to have you back, and, and I'll share why. A, you know, it's Women in Sales Month, and, and sadly, that should be <laughs> not just one month. But also I'm seeing a reoccurrence and it's, I do a lot of work in women, uh, women's group with coaching, uh, you know, founders and um, sales leaders. And there's still a lot of fear based and a lot of confidence lacking. And I don't know if it's getting worse or if it's just I'm, I'm more immersed in it. But I really wanted to get your take on that. And maybe before we dive into that, you could start by sharing for those who are listening and hearing you for the first time. Uh, I know you're doing a global study on women's confidence and communications, and I think you're four and a half years in, so kudos to you. But maybe you could give a high-level overview of kind of what, what you're looking to accomplish in this study and, and perhaps why you started it in the first place. Sure. So I am a sociologist, and I focus on women's confidence. So I started this study four and a half years ago. It's a seven-year study. And I talk to women all over the world about what influences their confidence, what strengthens their confidence, what hurts their confidence, what strategies do they use that are both helpful and unhelpful. And then how do we differ? How do we differ by our early childhood experiences, the parenting style we were raised under, uh, the country we were born in, 
whether we have English as a second, third, fourth language, uh, our experiences with sexism, racism, ageism, queer phobia, and so on. Uh, the school, um, the, uh, the country that we went, um, that we did our schooling in, uh, toxic workplaces, female-female rivalry. I look at all of that and look at how do we differ. So most of the research on confidence, certainly if you extrapolate that out to the self-help genre in general, is quite white-based. So it's white researchers talking to white participants, coming up with strategies that really only work for that segment of the population. And I really wanted my study to be different. I wanted to know how women across the world in every industry, across ages and experiences um, dealt with confidence. So we talk about confidence in the study. We also talk about apologies and the tendency for women to over apologize for small issues. Then we talk about praise and compliments. How do we receive it? and mindset in terms of when something good happens in our life, how do we handle it? When something, and we don't get the outcome we wanted, how do we handle it? So I look at all of that. So uh, the study is a qualitative study. So I, these are in-depth interviews. So I talk to women one-on-one -on -one for an hour, but then multiple times. So it takes, you know, uh, on average about five, six phone calls for this interview to be complete. So I am swimming in data, if you can imagine. Uh, my youngest participant is 18. My oldest is, I think, 84, uh, literally across every industry. And 26 countries have participated in it. And so what I'm going to do at the end is I'm going to write a bunch of academic articles. But more importantly, it'll be books for the general public. One on confidence, one on apologies, one in the last two sections. And then wrap everything up in a new TED Talk. So my first TED Talk was in... 2019, how apologies kill our confidence. 2019, and then uh, I started the study. And so, really, the new, the next TED Talk will be what have I learned after speaking to women for seven years across the world? What have I learned? Here's what works for certain women. Here's what works for certain industries. Here's what doesn't. And I will share all of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's. I mean, I just think. Um, a, thank you for doing this. Um, obviously, there's a huge commitment there, but to get those answers, and, and I love that you're doing it with a diverse audience because, you know, white is is one race and there's just so, and it's sad because even when you think about, you know, uh, medication, um, it's all, it was white men, right? There's nothing, contraindications for women. So it's great that you're recognizing that we need a diverse audience to understand, like, the backgrounds, the culture, the school, everything that, you know, there's biases that are hidden within biases that we might not know or think that are actually contributing to these things. So, I mean, the scope is huge. Yes. Yes. And you don't think about that because we all have, we all have biases because we all have a certain lens that we look at the world through, which is quite normal. So my lens would be a white, thin, uh, highly educated, middle-class woman. That's my lens, uh, able-bodied, cisgendered. And that's how I view everything, or that's how I did. And it's not until you, you start talking to women of every other ethnicity and ability and sexuality that you recognize, oh, I never have to think about that. That's not a fear of mine. That has never been a situation for me. And it's really important that we all understand that our hurdles are work at work are different. And so how can we mend those bridges as colleagues, as friends, as coworkers, as managers and employees? So the study is fascinating. <laughs> Every time an interview ends, I, I walk downstairs and I think, oh my goodness, this was so fascinating. I learned so much. And, and uh, now I want to interview another 50 women like this to learn even more. So uh, it's a very time intensive process and overwhelming because the stories aren't necessarily happy. You know, when, when you, when you start digging deeper around, well, Talk to me about how your confidence is impacted at work. How does your manager impact your confidence? Uh, a lot of those are really sad stories of toxic workplaces and female female rivalry and 
horrific instances of sexism and racism and um, discrimination. And you think, oh, this must have been from the early 1990s before HR was a thing, right? And they're like, no, it was this past summer. Uh, It was six months ago. And it's awful. Some of the stories leave me shook, shook at what women are dealing with still in 2024 uh, in their workplaces And, and, and at home too, you know, the unequal balance of the gender division of household labor, really. I mean, that's a whole other topic that hasn't changed much either. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure those conversations, as difficult as they are, and I'm sure you have to have some protective boundaries up as well. So you're not taking all that in. But, you know, you're giving them a voice and you're allowing them to feel heard that I'm sure is making a difference and just revert, maybe not reversing, but, you know, allowing them to know that what was, you know, there's no shame or remove the shame because of what was done to them or what's continuing to be done to them. Well, what has been consistent is at the end of our chats, uh, I ask my participants, how was that? You know, what was that experience like for you? And the most common response to that is participants will say to me, Maya, that was therapeutic, but not therapy. Along those lines of that phrase, hands down, that's the most common thing. They thank me. They have enjoyed the process of talking to me. They felt uh, validated, heard. They felt that it was a a non-judgmental zone. So part of that, I think, okay, kudos to me for being a great interviewer and be able to create a space that is safe for people to open up and be honest about their confidence journey. But then part of me thinks, one of the few places where women feel complete non-judgment and safety should not be only in therapy and talking to me. And so how do we create that safety for ourselves? How do we create that, um, sort of being our own cheerleader, if you will, finding those micro moments. So that's really been something that has come out of this study is the importance to look for micro moments, micro moments of progress, micro moments of success, micro moments of joy. And if we are not getting that from our workplace, we must get that from ourselves. And I can get into some strategies on that if you want. Yeah. And just before that, I think just because you've actually held space for them and showed them and allowed them to feel like heard and validated, they might then, you know, be a little bit more, um, they might be stronger in those conversations and push back a little bit because they know what good looks like now before they didn't have any barometer of this is just the way it always is. So because it was different with you and allowed them to feel, oh, okay, this is how I should be treated. Who knows? Maybe they're going to start, you know, this revolution of pushing back a little bit, knowing that that's not acceptable. Well, I get so many emails and uh, DMs on uh, Instagram from my former participants who say, oh, I just had a meeting and I was two minutes late and I came in and I looked them all in the eye and I said, thank you so much for waiting. I didn't apologize and I feel so friggin' amazing. And, you know, and then I just send like a whole bunch of uh, high five emojis and, and whatnot. And I, I do, I, I get those emails all the time and I love them because they say, oh, I, like I, I interviewed an anesthesiologist, for instance, who was apologizing a lot in the OR and she thought she was being polite and collegial and uh, perhaps deferential and her attending pulled her aside and said you got to stop apologizing because you're freaking out the nurses Uh, they don't know like they don't know why you're saying sorry so much like do you not know what you're going to do and she was like what I was just trying to be nice and deferential and he's like no just do your job, do it with authority. And uh, so she messaged me afterwards to say that they meet up her and attending once a week now on Fridays and they talk about, okay, what would you feel compelled to apologize for this week? And 
uh, what circumstances were you in when that happened? And he's really kind of become an accountability coach, but also a, a mentor for her. Or I'll, I'll say, I'll get messages from women saying, I, I spoke up. I spoke up. I had your voice in my head and I spoke up at a meeting and I disagreed with my boss or I put up my boundaries and it was so uncomfortable, but I did it. And I love those stories. And uh, I think that'll be, you know, probably part two of the study afterwards to, to say, you know, how did your life change after participating, after speaking to somebody for five or six or seven hours at a time uh, or over time? How did that change motivate you or anything like that? So I'm interested in that also. And those are the micro wins, right? When they lean into the the discomfort and realize I didn't die from this. I didn't enjoy it, but I did it anyway. I think that dopamine hit is going to, you know, keep them doing it more and more and more. Um, And one thing I remember from our previous conversation, just on the apology, um, you said it's it's not that men don't apologize, that they feel they have a higher threshold for when they feel an apology is warranted. So can you talk to us a little bit about, because I hear it a lot too, women starting and ending their sentences with sorry. And I, a lot of it is habit, right? They just, they're unaware that they're doing it, but maybe share, you know, what you're seeing and, and even the perception when you interviewed people about, you know, how they perceive that person, regardless if they're an anesthetist or, you know, title, it goes down because they're apologizing. They're, they're kind of seen as meek. Yes. And so it's true. So uh, if men and women both deem a behavior or a situation to be offensive that they were a part of, they would both apologize. So it's not that men avoid apologizing. It's that men have a really high threshold of what they deem worthy enough to issue an apology for. Women are on the opposite end of the scale. We have a a much lower threshold for what we consider to be an apology worthy moment. And that is for a whole host of reasons. Uh, We are constantly on the lookout for how we maybe, perhaps, may have um, been misinterpreted or misperceived or uh, we didn't say something the way we actually wanted to. And so we have been encouraged and socialized to constantly be on the lookout for how other people in that room are feeling and taking our words. And that's exhausting. And it's a mental exercise uh, that we wage every day of our working lives. And so we say something and we are reading the facial expression and we're thinking, oh, ooh, that, did that come off incorrectly? Oh, I'm sorry. That's not really what I meant. Oh, I'm sorry if you took that the wrong way. I'm sorry. My words are jumbled right now. And, you know, we do that because there is this expectation that girls and women will be helpful accommodating and nurturing. And when we are not helpful enough, accommodating enough, nurturing enough, we apologize for it. Just look at how most women say no, when they have to decline something, they have to say, no, I can't be there. I can't go to that event. I can't stay late at work, whatever it is. It's, oh, I'm so sorry. I can't because, and then a long explanation of what they're doing with their time. And the expectation is that we will say yes. And, you know, and when I ask women, how, how do you say no when you have to decline something? Talk to me about how you put up your boundaries. <laughs> and there's this long pause and women say, uh, I don't say no. <laughs> I try to never say no. I say yes, even when I don't want to. Uh, just the thought of having to say no to some people causes them great anxiety because their identity is tied to this idea that they want to be liked. They just want to be liked by everyone and to be nice. And they don't want to disappoint and let other people down. Um, So people pleasing comes up constantly in the study. Mm -hmm. That's funny. That's what I wrote down. People pleasers, just as you were explaining that, but it's almost like they create a hierarchy in their minds that if my audience isn't perceiving my message or I'm not getting the response I should like likable, um, nurturing, whatever, let me adjust it because the error must be on my behalf, my behalf. Meanwhile, it's totally could have been them. They're not listening or they just made a, you know, we've interpreted their unspoken cue inappropriately, but we assume the blame immediately. 
Yes, we do. And I, I did that often when I was teaching at the beginning. I would I would be in a big lecture hall and I would uh, make eye contact with somebody and they would just be like, mm, they would kind of like look at me. They'd give this you know, scrunched up face looking like they don't know what I am talking about. And I would go up to these students afterwards and I'd be like, was it confusing for you? Did I not say it correctly? Are you, uh, are you enjoying the class? And they'll be like, what? That was like the best lecture I've ever attended. I'm like, what? The whole time I thought you hated it. And they're like, no, I was just trying to process everything you were saying. And it was bringing up instances or examples in my life. And I saw myself in your, in, in your stories. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> and so I learned not to do that because you'll get that with public speaking. You'll get that with people in the audience just kind of looking at you, uh, processing things, but we misinterpret it, right? And, and you know, it's almost they have a constipated look. <laughs> like, are you or is it me? But yeah. funny, I had a similar story. I had a CEO sitting in with the training I was doing and he was just, and this wasn't too long ago, so I should know better, but it got to me because he was looking at me and he was almost like, he was a very good speaker. So I don't know if he was comparing or what he was doing, but I allowed it to get to me and I could feel that my, you know, when I'm getting on there and I have my pizzazz, he, I allowed him to make me a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. And I was really disappointed that that was happening because I was aware of it in the moment. But then after people came up to me and said, you were so good. And so it was like, well, how much of it did I really like? It, it's weird because you think I let it in, but how much did I really let in? Because the feedback was still positive. And part of it is like, did I hide it? And did I just feel it and not project that? But I think the story, the reason I'm sharing that is no matter how long you've been doing it, I think we're human and it still happens. Yeah, it does. And it shows you how easy it is to get out of that present moment, right? Because if you were fully mindful, engaged, and you were in that moment, you would have been in the zone and not in it. But those brief seconds that you stepped out of that moment, uh, you know, you allowed other people's visual cues or behaviors to sort of infiltrate uh, how you felt. Yeah. And I, I have to catch myself doing that also. Um, so when you mentioned women starting and ending their sentence with, uh, with sorry, what other, what, what else, what can we replace it with? Oh yes. And I forgot you, there was another thing you asked me about. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so you can replace it with thank you or excuse me. Those would be your two easiest to, to start with. Um, instead of sorry to bother you, it could be, excuse me, do you have a second to chat or when would be a good time to meet uh, instead of um, sorry for keeping you waiting? Thank you so much uh, for waiting for me. So uh, the most important thing is to bring awareness around under what circumstances are you apologizing? What's the environment? Who are the people that are typically there where you find yourself over apologizing? So that's just stage one. Just take a week just to observe where and when you are apologizing. The next step would be to gather a sense of how does it make you feel? If you're happy with your apologies, they make you feel good, then awesome. Keep doing that. I'm not trying to get women to never apologize. I'm trying to bring awareness to how often and for what reason they are apologizing. And so when I ask my participants, how do you feel when you've issued a genuine apology for something versus how do you feel when you've said, sorry to bother you, sorry to interrupt, sorry, could I ask a question, any of those minor ones. And so for the genuine apology ones, they're always saying, well, I feel bad that I did something that necessitated an apology, but I'm proud of myself. I feel good that I took accountability and responsibility for the issue. And I had that awkward conversation. And then there's some form of closure. They, they did their part and they can kind of move on because whether that other person accepts it or not, that's not in their hands. That's out of their control. Okay, great. So keep doing that. And now talk to me about how you feel when you've said all those little apologies. And more often than not, women are in two camps. One camp says, I actually feel stupid. I feel silly. I feel deflated. I'm annoyed at myself. I can hear it. I want to catch it before it happens. I question myself. Why did you just say sorry? It wasn't your fault. You shouldn't have said sorry. And then the other camp says, I don't even notice it because it is just part of my vocabulary. It just comes out uh, so often. And so. 
then the question becomes, well, how are we perceived? That was your question earlier. And the top responses for how we are perceived when we issue those smaller apologies is number one, lacking in confidence and incompetent, uh, not showing leadership material. We are creating unnecessary doubt in the listener's mind. People also say, I don't find them to be genuine. Why are you saying sorry all the time? Your stories are now meaningless. I don't actually believe your story because you say sorry all the time. And so they question whether we are sincere. And then people say, I see myself in them. So that usually came from former chronic over apologizers who would say, oh my gosh, I used to do that. I used to sound like that. I know what they're going through. And then others would say, I want to help them. I want to send them a TED talk or a podcast or something to read. I want them to know they don't have to keep apologizing. And then it's sort of like a, a journey of what my participants go through, starting with awareness, trying to figure out under what circumstances and who they're with that they feel compelled to say sorry. How do they feel? Which apologies do they want to keep and which ones do they not? And then once that's been figured out, well, what can you say instead? Sometimes it's excuse me. Sometimes it's thank you. And sometimes it's just a breath. It's just silence. Just taking a breath where you would normally say, sorry, is that clear? Sorry, am I rambling? Sorry, am I making sense? All of those where you can just take a breath <laughs> and be okay with that silence. It's almost like a filler word, you know, like, mm -hmm. but, and uh, I, th I think that's what it could be as well when I heard that. But I would fall into the camp of, <laughs> I want to help them. And so what's the line between unsolicited support versus like, you know, let me forward you Professor Maya's TED Talk yeah. or just bringing awareness for them because a lot of people will just continue going through the motions unaware that people, they're, they're going down rungs in other people's, um, you know, experience based on how they're speaking. Yeah, so many participants say, oh, I'm going to send your TED Talk to my best friend or my mother-in-law or my cousin. I want them to listen to it. And that's that's usually where, where you can do a one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one email, a one-on-one -on -one text, a chat where you can say, you apologize a lot. Why, why is that? Why do you think you're apologizing? Is it certain circumstances, environments, people? Do I make you feel like you need to apologize? What's going on? And have you ever uh, read anything about it? Can I send you a great TED Talk uh, I know? Or can I send you a podcast to listen to? And that's usually where the conversation starts opening up. People who listen to my talks uh, oftentimes send me a message afterwards to say, we started an accountability group at work and we are calling each other out you know, in a friendly way about apologies. And once your attention has been brought to apologies, it's really hard to not hear them everywhere you go. Yeah, no, it, it's like the reframe. I was doing a course yesterday and it was instead of saying I have to, I get to. Yeah. And I feel I feel like uh, the once you become aware of the sorry, you, you the pattern start is you say sorry, you go, oh, oh I said it again. <laughs> yeah. And then you after a few trip ups, you get in front of it because I'm part of a women's accountability group and there was a few rules and one of them and they, they've never heard anything about you, but there's uh, they will after this, <laughs> but there's no apologizing. Like there's yeah. no apologizing. And so I love that it's front and center for, for a lot of people because we know the perception of other people, but like you said, you know, you feel uh, not shame, but you're just like, why did I do that? Like I know better. Yeah. And it really does plant a seed of doubt in people's minds. A minority of my participants will say, oh no, when I hear somebody apologize profusely, I don't think less of them. I think they're just really polite. Maybe they're anxious. Um, I think they're good people. But the vast majority of how uh, of my participants say, no, it's actually annoying. It's very frustrating to hear uh, somebody apologize profusely for no good reason. And the majority of my participants don't feel good doing it. Don't feel good doing it. And so I think that's what the interviews have allowed them to explore and connect with other experiences in their life, whether it was the parenting style they grew up under, perfectionist expectations. Why do I feel the need to apologize? I attended a webinar 
to hear a fellow social scientist talk about her latest research and her new book. And I was really excited to hear her. I think she was maybe in Miami, I know the University of Miami, and she got onto the call. It was a 65 minute Zoom uh, talk and she apologized five times. And I made notes of what she apologized for. So first time she apologized was because of the tech issues. Now she was zooming into another university, like in another state, right? She had absolutely nothing to do with the tech, but she apologized because there was a five minute delay in starting. And so she apologized for that. Then she apologized for uh, talking uh, too, too passionately. And she's like, I don't know, am, am I kind of going uh, over the top? I'm such a passionate person. And I was like, gosh, like what? We're apologizing because we're too passionate. And then her third apology was for talking too much. She thought her responses were perhaps too long. And she was the keynote. Like we were all there to hear her, right? And then the moderator jumped in and said, no, 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 you don't have to keep apologizing. Everything is going well. And then she actually apologized for apologizing. <laughs> and I like cried silent tear. And I was like, no, no, what is happening? Yeah. And you start focusing on that. I know when I, you know, do presentation skills training and, and then you're just counting the likes and yep. I, the same with, with apologizing. You just like stop because I've lost respect and you don't even, you don't even hear what they're saying anymore, especially for a keynote with that, you know, those accolades behind you and everyone's coming to hear and, and then they're doing it. You know, that's, that's, that's tough. Mm hmm. So talk to us about when you said awareness, the first stage is becoming aware. And I feel awareness is a big, a big, you know, it's the first stage in, in change. But, you know, I always talk about being an observer of herself and really becoming aware and looking, looking inward and, you know, slowing down enough to do that because some people don't want to do that and they're really afraid of what they're going to see. But the reason I start here is because a lot of time um, there's that voice in our heads that I can't do this, that I shouldn't start this new business, that I, you know, I deserve this and it's below my actual capability. And it really is fear-based. And so can you talk to us about what, what we can do to stop this perpetual, you know, radio station of negativity playing to the point that it becomes paralyzing. And then that's all we know. And we just, we stop trying. Yeah. I'm just making notes because I have so many things I want <laughs> So many things I want to talk about. Okay, so one of the questions in my study is when something good happens to you in your life, you get the outcome that you wanted. What are you immediately thinking? What is that voice in your head saying? And the most common response is there is momentary joy. And then I move on. That was the goal. I achieved the goal. I'm checking it off the box and I'm moving on. And women say, okay, don't get, don't get too confident. Don't get too comfortable because what's around the corner. When's that other shoe going to drop? If this positive thing happened, what negative thing is going to happen to counterbalance it? So that immediately is distressing because when the good happens, we should be able to recognize it, internalize it, uh, let it seep into us. And a minority of participants, complete outliers in the study say to me, oh, when the good happens, I take a few deep breaths. I close my eyes. I just want to memorize this moment and this feeling. I breathe in that joy. I tell my partner, I tell my kids, I tell the people that I love, I want to celebrate this. Okay. I love that. That should be how we handle our successes, big and small, because they all matter. And, but those are outliers in the study. So then the follow-up question is, okay, let's say you didn't get the outcome you wanted. Something negative happened. What are you thinking and feeling then? Immediate, immediate self-blame. What did I do? Um, that was a stupid mistake. So it's harsh tone, ridiculing ourselves, immediate self-blame. And, and then I say, how long does that stay with you? Because <laughs> the joy is momentary, right? So how long does the negative stay with you? And those answers are disheartening because they will say, oh, it keeps me up for a few nights. I'll remember it in the middle of the night and then I'll cringe. I'll get a physical reaction like, God, that was so stupid to say. Or how did I not uh, 
uh, catch that mistake earlier? Why didn't I anticipate this? And it will stay with them for days, for weeks, for months. And then one of the questions I ask my participants at the end is to give me a list, 10 things that they've done in their life that they're proud of. And again, more common than not, a frequent response to that is, can I give you my top 10 failures instead? Can I give you my top five worst moments? Can I give you my top three most cringe-inducing, embarrassing moments? And I'll say, no, uh, there's no need to replay that. Let's talk about what, what have you done in your life that you are proud of? I mean, it could be huge monumental things. You, you uh, graduated from university, you got the career that you wanted, but it can also be really small, inconsequential things that you are simply proud of having done. You nail this recipe. Uh, you drive your kid to school every day. You get to spend that one-on-one -on -one time in the morning. You learned how to crochet, anything. And I thought that this question would be the feel-good question of the study. And it is a question that takes the longest for my participants to answer. And that is tied to how they perceive the good and the bad in their life. So the negative critical talk is present in the good moments. It's present in the bad moments. It keeps them up. And so what do you do with that? There's a lot of different strategies I will give. Uh, let me talk about spot the success. Uh, so this is when you itemize what you have done well in your day. And I'll give you an example from the study. So I had a participant, she was an ER physician, and she was feeling like she was apologizing every day, all day for everything beyond her control. I'm sorry the healthcare system here in Ontario is falling apart. Uh, I'm sorry that you had to wait 24 hours in the ER. I'm sorry that you're gonna have to wait a few months to see a specialist. I'm sorry that we can't get you the x-ray or the ultrasound for another two days. I'm sorry you didn't get the diagnosis. I'm sorry for everything. And she was starting to hate her job. And one day, as she was leaving work, she sort of hit rock bottom. I was really questioning, what is she doing working in the medical field? Was she making any difference? And she just had a, an aha moment where she said, okay, this is it. From the moment I leave the hospital and I drive home until I get home, I'm going to spot the success. She was going, I mean, she didn't use those words, but that's essentially what she was doing. And so she was going over in her head every little micro moment that went well. Okay, the nurse that normally hates me uh, asked me how my weekend was. I caught a medication error. Um, a uh, patient thanked me. I was able to have a nice two minute chat with the x ray technician. Uh, you know, all these little things that normally she would have just discounted. And so she was itemizing it and saying it out loud to herself. And then she was able to not only do that on the ride home, she was able to institute that in person, I mean, like at her job live at, as the moments were happening, right? So she'd have this negative moment and then she would say, okay, but this positive thing also happened. So it's different than toxic positivity or always sort of looking for um, the cheerful side of things or, you know, fake it till you make it kind of thing. No, this is evidence-based. This is look for what you did well. What part of success did you play a part of and say it out loud? And those are really those micro moments of joy that we have to um, adhere to. Or else we're going to get to the stage where we externalize all the good in our life, right? It was good luck. It was timing. It was other people. It was the team. And then we internalize all the bad. It's all my fault. I should have known better. Mm -hmm. I love that. The stacking those mini wins. And, it, you know, I think over time it, it can become repeatable because you, you start looking for new ways of, you know, in this situation, when I kind of reframed it or did this, it allowed me to achieve this. And you want to repeat that feeling. And I, I think the alternative is when you're going through all these 
um, negative. It's just get heavy. Like what I was hearing is just, it's heavy that you just want, you want like to get away from it. So there's, there's some levity and freedom um, for always not looking at, you know, the negative and just saying like, what are the positives? Uh, what question here, professor, what, what is the science behind saying it out loud versus writing it down? Yeah, so that that comes out of the research around self-compassion, where they find that saying these things uh, out loud sort of cements the ideas more to you and that you want to say to yourself um, what they call soothing vocalizations. You know, I, uh, I'm not perfect and that's OK. I did my best today. I tried. And it... Um, it does something. I mean, I don't know exactly the uh, the science around um, the psychological science around that, uh, how it enters the brain in a different way. But uh, I just know all the research around uh, self compassion, and there's been um, two two thousand studies done on self compassion, um, done to show that when you practice these acts of self kindness, self compassion, mindfulness, that you change how your body responds to stressful situations you can be your own cheerleader you can know that there's always one person that has your back and and that's you so uh yeah it it is important to say these things out loud to yourself Um, i i i think and i just know in, in sales when we say you know Instead of just a lot of time, we, we assume that it's valuable. And so I always say, you know, what was that helpful or what was value about that? And I feel that when when they say it, I like your word, it cements it because they're saying it out loud. They're hearing their voice mm-hmm. and they're reminding them that this is actually helpful. You were valuable or whatever that is versus me just saying, you know, assuming they're connecting the dots. And I think it's important to hear it out loud. Um, it's just like when you um, like another strategy would be uh called the done list. Uh, It's the anti to do list. I'm sure your listeners have probably heard of it. And it is about writing stuff down rather than just itemizing things in your head. And seeing it visually does something different. So on those days, we are feeling frustrated that you didn't get to do everything on your to do list, what you're supposed to do with the done list is you are supposed to this is a limited time thing, you would do this for maybe one or two, three days, maybe a week max. And you do this exercise when you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed and you itemize every single thing that you did that day on a piece of paper on your phone. And then you look at it at the end of the day, because oftentimes we think, oh, I didn't get to do these two things. Therefore, my day was a failure. But when you look at every single thing that you did, right, you worked out, you made your kids lunch, you had a... um, I don't know, a great conversation with your partner, you drove to work. I mean, the list is endless, but we are often only looking at what we didn't get to do. So this is a visual reinforcement of, no, your day wasn't a failure. You actually accomplished a lot. And it's okay that some days you don't accomplish as much as you want because you did do a lot. And it's, it's just another way to refocus your attention on the evidence rather than allowing that negative critical voice take over. All of these exercises really are meant to turn down the volume on that negative critical voice. That negative voice will be there always. Uh, That comparison will be there always. That self-judgment will be there always. The point is not to eliminate it. It is to tone it down, to turn the volume down, right? We're not aiming for no self-judgment. We're aiming for less self-judgment. And I, I think part of it is acknowledging that we're not going to get rid of, rid of it, but yeah, like turning it down. But are there, like for me, when I, I have morning practices and I have rituals that I know when I can really ground myself and anchor myself and be intentional with how I start my day, I can get in front of those things. So mm-hmm. the comparison that doesn't kick in. So what are you seeing in terms of like people, I guess two camps, those who just roll out of bed and start scrolling their phone and letting everyone in before they protect themselves, but others knowing that those triggers exist and you know, anchoring themselves, doing their morning gratitude, whatever their, their, their rituals are so that they can, um, really turn down that vault or almost as close to off as you can get it. Yes. And so those are participants who have 
a list of things that they do to strengthen their confidence in the morning or at night, these little rituals, habits, activities, exercises, it's never one thing. And so it goes from getting a good night's sleep to being able to do some type of movement first thing in the morning, uh, some type of stillness, whether that is journaling, meditation, breath work, yoga, as some type of format like that. Some of my participants say, I eat the same breakfast every single day. It just, I find it takes the hassle out of decision-making and uh, I like to take the same route to work every day. I like to listen to a certain music to get them prepared for the day. Other participants have sticky notes around their computer or in their home office or in their bathroom or wherever they uh, work. And just to remind themselves of self-compassionate phrases. And it, it's a lot of work. It's, an, it's never one thing. Confidence is not just, oh, I'm going to institute this one thing and now my confidence is going to skyrocket. It is a plethora of little strategies and habits that you consistently do. Not daily, not all the time, not perfectly, but you consistently do these micro actions that can have monumental changes on your well-being when you look at them cumulatively cumulatively. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what you shared, I actually practice on my kids. They're little guinea pigs. <laughs> yes. Yes. But I have a seven-year-old daughter and I'm always talking about confidence. And I'll just say like, if I want her to go ask for something, she'll be like, you go. And I'm like, you go big girl, confident yeah. girl. And I'll just say, what's the worst thing that could happen? And she's like, they could say no. And I'm like, yeah, will, will you, will you get hurt? She's like, no. And so I find little things like that when you just go, what's the worst thing, especially in a business environment, they could decline the meeting. They could say no. They could say we're working with somebody else. But I think the resentment and the, the beating yourself up in your mind is worse than actually asking the question. And that's basically exposure therapy. And that is also quite beneficial where you are exposing yourself to the possibility of an awkward moment, conversation, or hearing the word no or making a mistake. And when you do that in sort of safe moments on a consistent basis, you start to push yourself out of your comfort zone consistently. So doing that with our kids is really quite beneficial. So when you take your kids to the doctor, they should be the ones that hold their health card and check themselves in. You can be beside them, but they should present their health card and say their name and what time their appointment is. When you go to Tim Hortons or you go to the drive through roll down the window for them, they should place their order. And doing that consistently then allows them to talk one-on-one -on -one with the teacher in a more confident way or one-on-one -on -one with the doctor rather than having that hierarchical power differential between child and adult. And that, yeah, that's just really beneficial. And just constantly trying different things out, new things. Um, it's, you know, it's one of the questions in the study. I ask my participants, are there things that you do in your life that you think, oh, if you just had the confidence to do, try out an activity or an experience. And then talk to me about what do you think you don't do? Experiences, hobbies, whatever it is because you think, ah, oh, I don't have the confidence to try that out. And their answers are fascinating. How many times we have taken ourselves out. And, you know, participants talk to me, I don't do any public form of sports because I, I don't think I'm an athletic person. So I don't want to be um, running a, a 5k in front of others. Cause I'll probably just walk the whole thing and I'll feel miserable or I'll, uh, I don't know how to ski cause I didn't grow up skiing. I don't like public speaking. I had a horrible time in high school and I had this bad moment and I just, I don't like it. Well, all of those things can be changed uh, in micro ways, right? You can take a Toastmasters. Actually, Toastmasters came up so much in the study. I was not uh, prepared for that. How many of my participants have taken Toastmasters around the world and had a really beneficial uh, time from doing that, just getting um, feedback from qualified people in a safe environment to practice their public speaking. And they were able to uh, 
change their outlook on public speaking, which is great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All, all amazing. And it it shows that there's, that there is ways to get out of them. If you, if you're, you know, if you're choosing and and you want it bad enough, where does self-worth intersect with confidence? Oh, like just when you were saying that, that's what came to me when people like, I'm not, you know, I'm not confident in running publicly or speaking publicly. That's one thing, but is, is some of that masked in that I'm not worthy to do this or I don't, or the bit of self-sabotage, I don't deserve to do this. Like where does that, is it buried in it? Is it part of it or is it something completely different? That's deep (laughs) because (laughs) that usually comes from what we sort of call our crusher statement and we all have one and it's that deepest most vulnerable part of ourselves it's that voice and everybody has one but their voice says something different for many many of us it is i am not good enough uh i am not smart enough i don't deserve this and those really uh those were rooted in early childhood moments, whether you had overly critical parents, you had faced some type of trauma, you were bullied in school, you had a really traumatic experience doing something and felt less than a guidance counselor told you to aim lower in life, right? Any of those types of moments that stay with you. I mean, I could give you so many examples of that, where my participants, you know, as 40 and 50 and 60 year olds still have that little voice saying that. And, you know, when they win an award, they're momentarily happy, but then that voice inside is saying, but do you really deserve it? Because did you really outperform your colleagues, you know, your colleagues are better than you. And so being able to create distance between that voice and the belief in that voice, that is a journey. Uh, I've spoke to one participant in her forties who in grade eight, she put her hair up in a ponytail and she was really feeling herself. And a few people commented that her ears were so big that they hadn't noticed it before. And she never put her hair in a ponytail ever again. And in grade eight, you are, what are you, 13, maybe? And she was in her mid 40s, thinking about maybe for an event, she would try putting her hair up. And it sounds silly to some people, but that was a real traumatic moment for her where she didn't have the counterbalancing confidence from other people in her life to say, you are worthy. You are amazing. You are fabulous because her confidence was already low. And then to have that layered on top sort of broke her, you know, it's never one thing that kills our confidence. It is a slew of things with simultaneously having a rocky foundation. And when those things intersect, that's when our confidence gets hurt. And you, and you just think about like what was going through my mind, mind there is the importance of parenting and teachers and anyone that we have an influence of children at a young age because you're programming them. And I see it in adults. And that's why I'm like, I need to go and speak at the schools because I'm getting yeah. them too late. <laughs> yeah, that, that's absolutely that's absolutely true. It is tough being a parent right now because you are going up against so many agents of socialization that have almost more power than you. And so you are going up against media, traditional media, social media, peer influence, culture, uh, religion, school, and if you don't have a greater influence over your child than all of these other counterbalancing ones, you will be on an uphill battle. And yeah, it's, it's challenging. Just, it, it is. I mean, it's just very different from when I grew up, but I, I hear what you say. And I think just back to the importance of, you know, even like family time, dinner time where there's no technology and just really connection and, and, and 
and asking and, and letting them share, share their wins, share their failures and just making it safe. It's, it's really important. There was a, uh, I just got to look it up. There was a New York Times study that just came out. The New York Times did an investigation and found 5,000 child accounts, social media accounts, are being followed by 32 million grown men. And those are children who are, you know, uh, and it is so easy for them to see things, hear things, interact in situations where they shouldn't beyond their cognitive abilities and to witness things on TikTok and Snapchat and uh, Instagram that they shouldn't. So that's, that's a massive influence on your child, right? I, I attended a weekend uh, retreat workshop with the Institute for Child Psychology, such a great institute. And it was two just Saturday, Sunday, chock full of webinars. And I listened to, I think, 14 workshops. It took me uh, so long to go through them. And, I, and I'm a total nerd, right? Because when I listen to a webinar, I'm making notes, right? I'm listening, I'm highlighting my notes, I'm telling Steve, my husband, all about it. Every single a uh, person that gave a webinar at that workshop was either a psychiatrist or a child psychologist or a child uh, a therapist. Every single one <laughs> said, do not give your child social media before high school. Do not do it. And I, it was, uh, the evidence is so overwhelming, but for so many people who have how do you then take the genie out of the bottle? Because that is one of the number one killers of our children's confidence. Oh God, this this just op could open up another whole podcast, but it's it's scary. That's all I'll say is it's scary, and, and our job has become more important than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, I want to I want to briefly um, pivot, and you know, when you look at women's innate strengths and what comes to us almost easily, you know, our ability to build trust. We're nurturing. We are empathetic. We can, we're great active listeners. Why do you think that we still, if you think about the corporate world and it's, you know, a lot of male domination, why are we not leveraging more of these skills that come innate to us and we still kind of pull back? And is it, is it the surroundings that we feel we're the only woman, the only um, black woman, whatever in the room, or is there something else going on there that we're not saying like that's low hanging fruit that we can differentiate ourselves. And yet we're not playing that card. Because so much of the workforce is set up to reinforce and to reward masculine forms of leadership. And when you do not fit that mold uh, of usually a white male leader, uh, it becomes dizzying to try to conform and contort yourself into what you think will be valued in this company. But if you look around and you look at the leadership board and there's nobody there that looks like you, and there's very few women or very few women that look like you, very few women who are succeeding in your industry, women who are happy in their careers, what does that tell you? And so oftentimes we think, okay, well, I, I need to change. I need to take more leadership courses. I need to do more professional development. I need to mold. I need to, and really it's the culture that needs to change because what happens is men tend to hire other men who look like them, who they like, who they see an affinity with. And we know that women at entry levels in almost every single industry we are on par with men, Right. So that hasn't been a problem, but where the pipeline is stalling is mid-level management. That's where we're getting um, not enough women moving into that position, either changing industries, changing careers, moving to part-time. And there's this huge gulf between that and then the C-suite level. And the, I think McKinsey and Lean In did their 20, is it 2023 women at work? And they're seeing the same trends now that they did before. Women are dealing with a lack of transparency in the promotion ladder. We are dealing with bias in performance evaluations. Um, we know that, perform for instance, performance evaluations for men are longer and they are more likely to talk about men in leadership uh, lingo. 
their ambition, the male ambition for uh, promotion is stated as a clear value. Um, whereas for women, performance evaluations are shorter and 16% more likely to include the words kind, caring, helpful. Those aren't generally viewed as leadership qualities when they are phenomenal, phenomenal qualities, but they are stereotypically categorized as feminine um, qualities, feminine characteristics, and male, quote unquote, male uh, masculine uh, characteristics would be competition and um, whereas if a woman is seen as competitive, she is seen as uh, too individualistic, as bitchy, you know, then you start getting into likability issues. <laughs> you're either uh, too much or you're not enough, depending on the environment or the people that you're working with and the biases that they have. Well, how do you change that? How do you change the culture? I just went down a deep dive into uh, gender bias research and what works and what doesn't. How do you try to eliminate the bias in performance evaluations or hiring metrics? And there's not a lot of good stuff out there. And unless you can change the culture, not much trickles down in terms of differences in women's everyday work experiences. And so that, yeah, that really comes down to what is the culture of the corporation uh, or the department that you're working for. Um, I was giving a talk yesterday and one of the participants, uh, listeners chimed in and said, uh, when she, when her boss is sick, her boss just sends a message to everybody to say, I'm sick. I'll be out of the office. I can't make it. And has set the tone that she doesn't apologize for calling in sick. And she calls out her female staff that apologize and say, don't apologize. You're allowed to be sick. If you're sick, you're sick. And it has changed the culture in that environment. Whereas this participant, this um, uh, listener said in her previous job, she felt like she had to defend why she was sick, had to over explain, give too many details about uh, what was going on in her personal life and how she was going to make up those hours. Whereas in this new job, there was just the benefit of the doubt was given to people. Okay, you're sick. We believe you. We'll see you when you're well. And we know that you're going to do your job. So it's, it's a culture shift. Yeah. And, you know, I see that a lot too. And the only thing I would say is just when you are, for those of you looking for jobs and just, you know, look, look at the language they're using and, and talk to the internal employees to say, what kind of culture is this? And is it just words on the wall or do they actually embody it? And, um, you know, you feel it when you go in there. Cause I, I think there's a lot of time there's an incongruence there and then, and then you see those things happening and it's systemic. So, um, yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, well, listen, uh, we're coming up to the hour point and, uh, my head is full every time I speak with you, <laughs> I'm like we could just go on and on and on because you're just such a wealth of knowledge. So I want to thank you for your time and sharing the, the knowledge, the data, but also giving us, you know, a plan to move forward because it doesn't have to be heavy and this is the way it's going to be. It's also, there's ways to work through this. So I appreciate you always doing that. Uh, for those listeners, uh, professor Maya that want to connect with you, perhaps bring you in to speak, um, listen to your TED talk, all this stuff. What, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah. So they can email me at info professor Maya at gmail.com. They can go onto my website, professor Maya.com and message me there. And for any listeners who would like to participate in my study, I will give you a study brochure, but currently I'm looking for women who um, are women of color who don't identify as being white. So black, Hispanic, Latin, Middle Eastern, um, indigenous, and so on, or women who identify as being part of the LGBTQ community or women who identify as having any type of disability, whether that is a learning disability or they're on the um, spectrum uh, or they have ADHD or they have a physical disability, I would love to chit chat with them and they can um, reach out through info professor Maya uh, at gmail.com. 
Okay, well, we'll include all that in the show notes, and it will be great if you could get some participants. Yeah. Uh, love to support you in any way we can. So thank you again uh, for your time, and it was great seeing, seeing you again. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll see you next time.